but uh, today we're going over timber management. Um, and so uh, with timber management, uh, this is kind of a hodgepodge of topics that apply to a lot of what we've discussed already this semester. Uh, we just haven't really been able to get to some of these in detail earlier. Uh, so that's, that's what we're focusing on today. And so really we're looking primarily at timber marking uh, that we've discussed a little bit. Uh, we're talking about pruning, um, and I'll tell you why when we go over pruning, we really haven't gotten to it till the very end here. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about salvage and sanitation cutting. And so uh, you, you may recognize this smart art. I think uh, Dan Fichtel just used similar smart art uh, in his presentation a few moments ago. So uh, Dr. Culhavy, I think would be very happy with our program. Um, but what it's illustrating here, um, most of what we've done this semester is up here in planning. So with boundaries, you guys have your various GIS courses. Uh, you do land measurements at field station, that kind of gets into that. Inventory, you get into that in biometrics and timber cruising at field station, and then your map data and your GIS courses. So you kind of cover this stuff and a few other courses in our program. Uh, objectives, that's landowner objectives. We've talked about that all semester. We've hit on that very heavily this semester. And then prescriptions, we've covered very heavily this semester. Those are our silvicultural prescriptions. Um, but I think it was good that uh, Daniel was able to lead us off with his presentation because uh, a lot of what he was focused on was you have the prescription, how do you get the logger to implement that prescription, right? So how do you take that data you have and know how the loggers are actually going to work on the property? And so one key step we use to implement that is marking timber. And that's basically just a mechanism where the landowner is, or sorry, not the landowner, the, the forester is communicating the prescription to the logger so that the logger who's harvesting the timber um, or thinning the timber uh, can actually implement the prescription that the forester has created. So marking timber is a pretty important step, uh, but we haven't covered it in great detail yet. Uh, so when you look at timber marking, it can do a bunch of different things. Uh, one thing it can do is improve accountability. Uh, so here you see an example where they've put two paint marks on a tree. You've got one mark up high that's going to be easy for the logger to see, and then you have another mark down low. Uh, the idea here is that uh, the logger is going to cut this tree down, so when the forester comes out and looks at the site, say this was a thin, so they're not harvesting every tree, it's not a clear cut. Um, you know, you're not gonna be able to see this paint mark, but if you've painted these low enough and you know what size stumps they're gonna be cutting, you can come out and you can check and you can make sure that all the stumps have paint on them, that the logger was not cutting trees um, that, you know, they weren't supposed to be cutting. Well, I mean, this is just paint on a tree, right? So if you had a dishonest logger, um, you know, they could come out and they could cut, they could cut this tree down over here, right? And then they could get some paint and put it on there as well. So there's a few other things you need to think about with this. Um, I have seen contracts for loggers uh, where there are stipulations in there, where the logger has put some amount of money, maybe $5,000, whatever it is, into an escrow account um, until the logging operation is completely resolved. Um, there may be stipulations in there that if BMPs aren't followed, that money is not recouped to the logger. Um, it's used instead to fix any BMP violations. Uh, but other stipulations I've seen say the forester will be inspecting the, the logging operation at random times. And if they ever see anybody with any red paint, if they're going to mark with red like here, if they ever see red paint in a truck, red paint anywhere on the job, um, the, the logger forfeits that $5,000 escrow. And so you can put contract stipulations in just to, you know, disincentivize uh, loggers bringing out paint that's gonna, you know, mess with your, your timber marking. Um, the other thing I've, I've heard that's been done that's a lot more sophisticated, uh, the US Forest Service actually has special paint where they can send it to a lab for chemical analysis and they put a tracer in it. And so they will know if that is their paint on the stump or if the logger has gone to Lowe's or Home Depot and just put a similar color paint on there. Um, and so it, it's a very detailed system. Obviously, if they have this special paint with the chemical tracer in it, they have to keep track of it because they can't just have, you know, someone giving that paint out to loggers who could then uh, use it to mark stumps. Um, and so that they have a detailed inventory system uh, with these special paints uh, where they track it and make sure they don't lose any cans of it. Um, 
but you know, so pretty sophisticated security, even though it's just pain on a tree. Uh, so you can improve accountability in that way. Um, and here's what a stump looks like. I took this picture up in uh, Oklahoma, I believe, on a warehouser job. And so you can see uh, some paint there on the stump. And so that you have to know, you know, where you're putting paint on it. You need to know what height stump they'll be cutting. And you'll see some logging jobs nowadays where they'll, I mean, they'll cut right down to ground line. Um, so this won't work well if you've got a logger that's really cutting all the way right down to ground line there. Um, but you can see here, they've put paint in a few places because it's a logging job. It's going to be messy. Some of the bark may get bumped off some of the stumps. You need to account for all that to make it work. Another thing you can do in timber marking um, is improve clarity for the logger. Um, so think about the lab we did out at the ballpark woodlot, right? Where you're marking your preferred, desirable, acceptable, cutting and coal stock. Um, well, if you have some, some trees, you've gone out there, you've graded the butt log on all of them. So say you have a cutting stock tree, but it's cutting stock because it's not a species that's desirable for your objective. That doesn't mean it's not a valuable tree, right? It might be something you want to remove from that site that still might have a grade one log in it, be of high quality. And so you can mark late log grade on the tree there where you've already graded them. Um, and you can help the logger with that. They'll pull all these back to the deck. They can see the paint marks on the trees hopefully, and it'll help the logger at the loader sort uh, to get the most value out of this particular operation. So you can imp improve clarity. Um, you know, those who've already taken field station, you went out with Mike Walker, um, and we looked at Bayou Blue, the tree farm there, the 6,000 acres he's managing, and that they do a lot of timber marking out there, um, and they're generally tallying as they mark. Uh, and so when you're going to walk through the woods and put paint on most of the trees anyway, or many of the trees, it's a good opportunity to do a tally. So you'll see they've got tally sheets that are all, you know, covered in blue paint, um, but it hopefully helps you get a pretty accurate tally. Um, if you think during field station, during the, the uh, timber estimation week, uh, you do the bid sale cruise uh, typically in most years. Uh, and again, Mike Walker can give you that list of trees and say, these are the diameters of every tree with blue paint on it. So it helps him develop a real accurate inventory. And when they're selling that track, when they're putting that tract up for bid, uh, that's good, accurate information that hopefully will get the landowner as much money as possible uh, out of those bids. So, so it helps you with an accurate tally. If you know what you're doing when marking timber, uh, it can be efficient for the operator. It can help the operator move through the stand in a way um, where they're not wasting a bunch of time. Um, if you look at this particular piece of equipment, it looks like it's a dangle head feller. And so you have to know your equipment. That dangle head feller has the saw head on it. and It's just kind of rocking. It's got to flip it out and then hit it onto a tree and saw it. So if you have two trees real close together, it may not be able to cut one without doing a lot of damage to the other one. So that's something you need to be aware of. You need, you need to know the type of equipment your logger is going to be using and incorporate what their equipment can do and what it can't do in your marking. You want to think about basic efficiency measures with marking anyway. Um, you may want to mark the north side and the south side of every tree, just so whichever way they're coming from, they can see which trees are marked, uh, which trees are not. Um, if you know where the log decks are going to be, you may want to just make sure all your, all your marks are facing the log deck. So as the logger moves away from the deck in the, the feller, you know, they'll be able to see which trees uh, they need to cut. Um, so lots of different considerations that can go in there with operator efficiency. Marking gives a forester an opportunity to reduce residual damage. So here you see a big pine, white pine, uh, that's been skinned up uh, in a logging operation. Uh, this is particularly important depending on the time of year. Uh, you're logging a stand. And so think about right now here in late April, we've had a lot of rainfall. Um, if you get out on a logging job right now and you even look at a tree wrong, the bark's going to fall off of it. Um, so the, the, the cambium is actively developing a new layer of phloem right now. Uh, there's lots of moisture in the tree. The xylem that's being created is spring wood. So you have all those big uh, open tracheids and a conifer, for example. And so this is just a time of year when the bark comes off trees very easily. And so when you're marking, you need to think about that. If there's a great saw timber tree that you may be able to sell into a veneer market or some higher dollar value market, 
you may not want to mark trees to cut around it. You may want to leave those trees to protect it um, for the final harvest operation. The other thing uh, that's going to be really important in mixed stands, um, you know, when you look at modern logging equipment, they, they may have glass or windows up in the, the roof of them so they can look up. But if you watch that equipment work on a site, it doesn't take too long before they get a big pile of branches and leaves up on top of the cab. They can't look out the top of that window. Uh, many loggers get pretty good at identifying trees to species just based on bark. Most of them haven't taken dendro. It's just a skill they develop over time working in the woods a lot. But you know, you're not going to get a ton of control over composition if you tell a logger, go cut trees. Okay. Uh, if you want control over composition and you've got a forester out there on foot, uh, you know, they've all had dendro, they can go identify all these trees and they'll be able to mark a stand by species uh, much more effectively than a logger is going to be able to. And then it'll get, it'll get cut in a way where if you want to shift composition in one direction or another, you have a lot more control over that by marking timber. And then the final thing that timber marking is really going to do for you, it's going to improve the productivity in the future. And it's going to do that when you mark timber in a thin, again, think about that exercise with the Meadows and Skojak tree class system that we did at the ballpark. Um, you, you're out there as the logger picking the best trees to leave, cutting the trees that are less desirable. So you're focusing growth on those trees that have good crowns that are going to fuel future growth dominant and co-dominant crown positions, good stem form, the right species. Uh, again, you considered, you know, were they stable or increasing in value? You've considered all of that. And so you're putting all those site resources into the right trees uh, by marking a stand as a forester. There's a few other considerations we want to make with marking. Um, there are different types of marks you may want to put out there. Um, so if you're just doing a clear cut, you may not need a lot of timber marking, right? But you still may want to mark the property boundaries pretty heavily so the logger doesn't accidentally cut across a property boundary and then you end up in a dispute with a neighboring property landowner there. Um, so that's something you want to think about. Even if it's just a, a big patch of land where you're cutting a stand and you own everything around it, it's the same landowner, you may want to mark off the harvest area well just so they're not messing up your prescriptions on those adjacent stands and throwing your whole management plan off. Um, there's a lot of common marking for streamside management zones just to help the loggers, especially if, if you don't want them in an ephemeral stream, those may be hard to observe just driving around in a big piece of equipment. You may want to mark those SMZs off. Um, if you need an aesthetic management zone left by a road, you could mark that. So even in a clear cut, there may be things that you're marking. Um, we talked about log grade and product class already to help them sort. The other thing you may want to mark is hazard trees. Um, so say you observe an old fence line or something like that, and you've got metal in a tree. Uh, you could mark a hazard tree in that sense where, you know, metal in a tree could present a problem uh, for a saw or for the mill. Uh, so you may want to mark stuff off like that. If you looked at this fork tree here and, you know, way up high, it was dead. It had a dead top. That might be something you want to mark because the logger may not be able to see that dead top. So you, you could mark out hazard trees uh, so that the logging operation ends up being a little bit safer. The other thing we want to focus on uh, is uh, purple boundary blazes. Uh, so you guys are all getting an SFA forestry degree, uh, but we still don't want you out there doing all your timber marking in purple. Um, that would cause a whole bunch of confusion. Uh, purple in Texas legally has the same meaning as a posted sign if you follow a few simple stipulations. Uh, Texas isn't alone in this. It's also true in Arkansas um, and more than a dozen other states. So really you want to reserve purple paint only for property boundaries. Um, if you go out in Texas and you mark a seed tree cut or a thin or something like that with purple paint, it's going to confuse a lot of people because they're going to be looking at scattered purple trees throughout the stand they're going to be wondering, like, I'm near a property boundary. Where am I? It's going to cause a lot of confusion. Yeah, Cam, I see your hands up. Yeah, I was going to ask you, um, on properties that have, like, light poles uh, within their property boundary lines, before we go and put purple paint on it, do we need to check out what the city or because it's in our property, um, we're allowed to apply purple paint? Or do you know the rules on that? Purple paint on a utility pole? Yes. 
that are within. I don't know what the actual rules on that are. Um, from a property standpoint, often utility companies like that um, have a right of way. Um, so that, that property situation gets a little more complicated with the right of way they may have uh, to put that utility line through there. Um, so uh, you will commonly see purple paint on fence posts. Very commonly you see it on fence posts. There's no problem with that. Um, I, I've rarely seen it on utility poles, however. Yeah. Um, you, you could call the utility company uh, and see. I know, I, I think they have what, like a maybe 811 number. They'll, they'll come out and they'll uh, find buried utility lines. Uh, they, that, that number may have someone on there who can get you in touch with, you know, the right person to ask on the utility company. Um, we do have a, a company that comes in periodically and gives presentations, uh, ACRT. They do a lot of mechanical and herbicidal work maintaining utility right-of-ways, uh, but th those folks may know a lot more about it. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I haven't commonly seen a lot of purple paint on utility uh, poles. Um, here uh, on the legal stipulations, they want it on trees and fence posts, uh, and, th and this is all Texas specific. They want a vertical line that's at least an inch wide and eight inches high, and they want the bottom of the mark three to five feet off the ground. You'll see it all the time where it doesn't exactly meet those specs, right? It may be higher, it may be lower, it may not be those exact signs. Um, but I, I think the important thing to keep in mind, if someone's got purple paint on a boundary, whether it fits the legal stipulation or not, they don't want you in there. So you, you need to be careful and treat that the same uh, as if there were a trespassing sign. Technically, they're supposed to be 100 feet apart in forest land. Often, they're further than that. Uh, and uh, if you went into central or west Texas, uh, out in rangeland or open woodlands, they can be 1,000 feet apart. So, Okay, uh, there's a few other things you want to think about with timber marking. Um, there is no universal standard timber marking. We just saw how some states have purple for boundaries. Some states don't. There's no universal meaning to two lines on a tree. One line, blue paint versus red paint. Uh, a lot of folks use blue. Blue is one of the easiest colors to see out in the woods. And so basically, if you start a consulting shop or go to work in a consulting shop, or if you go to work for a big company and you're in an office there with five or six foresters, um, all working on timber harvesting, contracting, you wanna develop some sort of standard. Um, and you wanna develop that standard for a few reasons. Uh, one, you're probably going to be all working with the same loggers. So you want the loggers to get a hang for what you do from a marking standpoint so they're not confused. Uh, the whole point of marking is clear communication. You don't want to do timber marking that causes confusion. So if you mark it one way and then someone else in your office marks it a second way, someone else in your office marks it a third way, different colors, different marks that mean different things, the logger is much more likely to make a mistake, accidentally cut across a property line because they thought it was an SMZ and they thinned within it. You know, all sorts of problems could come up. Uh, the other place you want that standard is, say you're out sick, you know, you leave the company, you want another forester in that, in that unit to be able to go out, see the marks that have been done. Because remember, most logging contracts may be on a 12-month, 18-month, 24-month basis. Um, and so you want other foresters in your office to be able to go out, see how you've marked a stand and have a good idea what they should be looking for. They know that you've got, you know, blue boundaries on SMZs, you've put double lines, uh, horizontal lines on seed trees to be left, whatever it is you decide, uh, they want to know what color that they're looking for. Um, and then you can put that in the prescription. We haven't focused on that much this semester, but you can very easily put in a prescription, you know, leave 10 seed trees per acre, mark them with two lines of blue paint all the way around. Um, if you're only leaving 10 seed trees an acre, you may want to really mark them heavily uh, so that it's very obvious what they are because that's not going to be a ton of work, it being a few trees per acre. You can try and prevent timber theft with marking. Uh, we already went over that a little. Um, you can prevent unintentional timber theft by marking boundaries well, where a logger doesn't accidentally go across a boundary and cut a bunch of your neighbor's trees. Um, and cause problems there where you have to reimburse them or there's a potential lawsuit. Um, there's other things you can consider with timber theft. Uh, I know many of you uh, who were in field station last year, you probably got out in a clear cut with Trevor Terry from Hancock and he goes over the system that they use where they have a third party company 
each week that company gets a list of all the logging jobs they have right now that are active. That company doesn't talk to anybody at Hancock. They go out and they randomly set up cameras on a subset of them um, and they film what's going on. They have game cameras hidden out there basically. And then they have a ticket system where they're putting tickets um, on each load of logs going off the site. Um, those tickets get turned in at the mill. If the loggers lose the ticket books, they get charged some exorbitant fee for losing them. And so the, it's a system they put in place to prevent timber theft. Um, and, you know, occasionally they'll catch different types of timber theft. I was talking to Terry Anderson a while ago, um, and he had a story where, you know, a forester set up a timber sale, got a logger working on it, and then they went on vacation. And when they get got back, you know, two weeks later, uh, the logger had clear cut the 35 acre stand like they were supposed to, but then they had clear cut, you know, 250 additional acres of big timber. And they were just selling that and keeping all the money, uh, apparently doing it to support a drug habit, but uh, just massive intentional fraud, basically, and timber theft um, in that sense. Sometimes, again, you've got to keep in mind these logging operations are complex. Um, and so the logger may have a few people that work for, for them. Uh, that logger, you know, may have someone running the feller, may have someone running some skitters, some loaders. They may own that equipment. They've got a, a loan out on it, and they're paying those people as employees of the logging company. And then, depending on how the company works, they may not own any trucks, and they may not employ any truck drivers. Those may all be subcontractors. Um, and so those subcontracting truckers, um, I've heard of examples where um, a trucker who's a subcontractor shows up to a logging job at three in the morning, uh, gets in the loader, they had left the keys in the loader, loads up his truck with wood, takes it to a mill and sells it. Um, and they caught him with the camera system I described earlier. Uh, but there, the logger wasn't trying to do anything wrong. Uh, basically, one of his subcontractors uh, ended up being the responsible party. So, um, so lots of different stuff can go on with timber theft. It's just something you need to be aware of. You can have whole other categories too, where you have an absentee landowner so you've got a landowner living in Houston or Dallas or San Antonio, and they've got 50 acres that they inherited somewhere in Russ County or something like that, that they rarely visit. And uh, all of a sudden they show up to it at one point and someone's come out and completely clear cut it. So uh, got to be aware of timber theft and do what you can to mit minimize it. Um, we've talked about felling safety already, how you can mark hazard trees. Uh, visibility is important. So you got to remember when you're marking a stand that the logger is going to be in a cab that's probably eight to 10 feet up in the air. So you want to mark high. Um, if you've got 20 foot of yopon in a stand, it may be really hard to go mark that stand. It may be really hard to see the trees. And so anywhere you can improve visibility in a stand, it's going to make you more money if you're putting a stand out for bid. Um, and so if you've done good herbicidal control throughout the rotation, if you have a bad yopon problem, that can set you up for success at the end of the rotation. And then prescribed burning is a great tool where if you don't have too much, many fuels like yopon and you can get a prescribed burn in uh, that takes out or knocks back the understory and the midstory strata, it may be very easy to operate in a stand. It may be very easy to mark a stand. It may be very easy to see the timber that has been marked you'll get higher bids um, and the logger will do a better job harvesting it just because they can see everything that they need to see. Um, and so we've pretty much covered felling equipment as well. Uh, the, the only downside to timber marking really is that it's time and it's money. Okay. Um, and so in an ideal world, if, you know, we had unlimited resources to go mark timber, we'd probably mark every stand because it's going to give you better outcomes. Uh, but the reason we don't is because it's costing you $25 or more an acre. Um, that's a pretty old price. That's 20 years out of date. Um, and then a person is only able to mark probably five to 15 acres a day. That's going to depend on the terrain they're in, and it's going to depend on how many trees per acre they need to mark, and it's going to depend on how thick the vegetation they have to walk through is. Uh, Dan Fichtel showed us those really thick uh, mid-story and understories. You're not going to mark many trees a day when you're fighting through that all day. So, um, so that, that's the only downside to timber marking. It, it takes resources. So you have to use it judiciously because uh, you have limited resources. 
Any more questions on timber marking before we move on? Okay, um, so here's the second of our three timber management topics today. This is pruning. Um, so for those who are in urban forestry majors, uh, this is really timber management focused pruning. Uh, so it has some in common with arboriculture, uh, but arboriculture focused on a single tree out in an urban landscape, uh, that's a much more sophisticated operation than what we're talking about with pruning from a timber standpoint. Uh, pruning from a timber standpoint is all about growing wood without knots. That's what you're doing. Uh, generally, people aren't climbing trees to do this. Generally, we're dealing with species with one main trunk, so an X-current crown form, and you're not dealing with a complex D-current crown form uh, like a big maple that needs to be pruned in someone's front yard or something like that. So there are some similarities with the, the basic biology of trees and branches and all that, um, but uh, you know, I, I would argue that timber pruning is a much less sophisticated operation uh, than anything you would see from an arboricultural standpoint uh, in an urban setting. Here's uh, an example of some pruning in radiata pine in South America. It's an intermediate treatment. And again, you're trying to get rid of branches to grow clear wood so you can saw higher grade boards out of your log. Um, so think about the portable sawmill exercise y'all did at Field Station. Uh, you know, if you saw a board with no knots in it, that has fewer defects, that has a higher grade, uh, that sells for more money, typically. And so uh, you, you all got this in Wood Tech. This is a review from Wood Tech, right? Where we have tight knots and loose knots, where tight knots form from live branches being grown around. Loose knots form from dead branches being grown around. In some products, knots may be favorable. Uh, you may want knotty pine for walls in a cabin or a hunting lodge, something like that. It may be aesthetically pleasing, uh, but in a lot of other application, knots are a defect and degrade your boards. And so here's some simple diagrams showing you what you're doing with pruning. So here you have a tree with knots. And remember, these branches, they're not epicormic branches. These are, we're talking about our main branches. So they originated as a bud when the twig was at that height. So these branches, if you see a branch out here, it means there's a knot all the way to the pith. And so when you look at the tree, this is what it ends up looking like if you cut across it with a chainsaw. You know, every board that you saw out of this is gonna have knots in it. So the idea with pruning is you come in here, you cut these branches off, live or dead, um, and then you give it time. You have to think about this like a thinning. You don't thin and then clear cut next year or later that year, then why did you waste time thinning, right? The whole point is you remove the branches and you allow all these growth rings to continue growing without those branches in them. And so you end up with a defect free area to saw boards from. So here's an example. I took this photo on a dug fir out in Oregon a couple of years ago. So sure enough, look at this. These knots go right to the pith, right there in the pith. Um, and they come out, but check out what happened here. This branch self pruned later. The, this side of the tree may have had more light on it, right? Excuse me. And so uh, that, that's a knot on any board you're sawing on that side. Uh, this stand had not been artificially pruned, but trees will self prune, right? They'll go through natural pruning. And so you can see um, when the tree was about yay big in diameter here, this branch died, it self pruned. And so all the wood grown out here, no knot. You can saw boards out of this area without knots. So the whole idea behind a pruning is you would have come in here when the tree was maybe this diameter at this height, you would have cut off all these limbs. And now this area you could saw clear boards out of instead of a board with a knot. <coughs> um, when you prune a tree, um, ideally you don't want to cut a lot of live tissue. So ideally you'd be cutting it right up here. Um, Cause you can see there's live callus around that dead limb. Of course, ideally from a timber standpoint, you would not like a limb that this is this steep. You would hope that your trees have flatter limbs because you can see if you cut boards out of this, that's a big oval shaped knot. Whereas if you cut boards and the branch is sticking out at 90 degrees, it's a smaller circular knot. So ideally you would cut here, but if you're doing with the, this with a pole saw and this is 15 feet in the air and you're standing on the ground, you're probably gonna cut here. You're probably gonna cut some of this callus tissue you're not gonna kill the tree or harm the tree that much. Um, it, it will heal over in response to this. It's just gonna take it a little longer to do that. 
So basically any tool will work. Um, you've seen people over the years use lots of different stuff in different experimental settings, trying different things. Um, but the most common application is probably just manual saws where people are standing on the ground. So this is a lot of intense manual labor. You want the branches pruned flush with the stem like we just saw. You don't wanna leave coat hangers, a big branch, dead branch sticking out. You can hang a coat on. Um, but also you don't wanna rough up the tree too much. You don't wanna damage too much of the bark pruning it too closely. Remember, for every amount of wood you leave sticking out on a pruning operation, the tree has to grow that many inches out in diameter before it's growing the clear wood past that. Um, so you spent a bunch of money pruning, but then you didn't get the max benefit out of that pruning by leaving those long coat hangers on there. Um, so there are pole saws that are mechanical, you know, basically a chainsaw and a long pole you could use. You could use hand saws, but this right here in this photo, this is our most common application of pruning in the woods. Uh, companies will send out crews of workers. You may have 10, 20, 30 workers. And typically what they'll do is they'll walk through the stand once and they'll prune everything up to about 10 feet because they can do that with a saw, a hand saw with a short handle on it. They don't have to worry about this big long handle. And then if you're pruning up to 16, 17, 20 feet, whatever it is, they'll put the long handles on the saws or grab the saws that do have the long handles. And then they'll come out and they'll do another pass through the stand and they'll cut all those trees. It's gonna take a lot of effort per tree to do this. It's gonna cost you about $2.50 a tree ballpark to do this. And so you do not, I mean, $2.50 doesn't sound like much, but if you have 100 trees an acre, this is a $250 an acre treatment, right? And so you do not wanna go out early in a rotation and try to prune 500 trees per acre. You will never make any money doing that. You don't wanna go out and you don't wanna prune trees that are gonna get cut in a thin and sent to a pulp mill. There's no value in pruned pulp wood. And so really what you wanna do with a typical pruning operation, you wanna wait until after the first thin, you may wanna wait until after the second thin and then go prune just your final crop trees. If you have a tree that's out here that's forked in the bottom log, don't bother pruning it. If you have a tree out here and it's got a broken top, don't bother pruning it. If you've got a tree out here with symptoms of fusiform rust in the bowl, or if you've got a tree out here with a lot of curvature and sinuosity in the bowl, don't bother pruning it. You're trying to prune final crop trees that will grade out as high quality saw timber. You're wasting time and you're wasting money on pruning any other tree. Um, here's an example. This is a research study uh, in some Doug fir, I believe. And so they've, they're standing on top of the ladder and using loppers. So that, that's, you know, maybe a grad student in a study doing that, that's not something you're gonna see done operationally. That'd be pretty unsafe. But, um, and again, with pruning, we call this lifting. Um, so the idea is you're lifting the crown, obviously you're not picking up the crown, right? You're just cutting off the bottom part of it. Um, and with pruned trees, when you've done a lift, it almost always looks too aggressive. Uh, when you see a tr tree that's been pruned well, you almost always think, oh no, what have they done? Um, when you think about it, we think about lifting a crown in terms of a percentage often. Um, so if they go out and they cut off half of the live crown, it will be measured by height. So they will have cut, you know, if you have 10 feet of live crown here and they cut five feet of it off, that's half the live crown. It will always look like more than that low, right? Uh, because our trees, you know, we're talking conifers here primarily, they're kind of triangular in shape. And so we cut off the bottom half, we've cut off what appears to be a larger volume of live crown. But if you think about any live tree that you've been around, you know, think about a Christmas tree, right? Um, when you start looking at a Christmas tree that's been pruned into that perfect cone, the bottom half of it looks bigger. But as you look into the middle of the Christmas tree, there are long branches that don't have live leaves on them in the inside of the bottom of the crown. It's hollow. So think of it like a cone, but the leaves are only on the surface of the cone. So if you cut off the bottom half of it, you've lost a massive amount of volume and it's gonna look worse than it actually is because you haven't actually lost uh, too disproportionate an amount of leaves. Here's a first lift they've done in radiata pine in New Zealand. And again, you're trying, to, you're trying to spec out these lifts with your ultimate end products. So if they're going with a 10 foot log, do a 10 foot lift. If they're going with a 16 foot log, do a 16 foot lift. If they're going with a 20 foot log, do a 20 foot lift. Uh, but when you do those lifts, you also need to account often for a one foot stump. 
and so add your stump height in there as well. So you want to set up the lifts to link up to your products. The butt log will always be your most valuable log on a tree. It is the largest. Um, you may only want to prune butt logs. You may not, not find any value in doing a second lift uh, to remove branches from a, a second log. Um, in some species, you know, radiata pine can get 150 plus feet in height. You know, if you're pulling two log trees off there, it may be worth it sometimes, but usually with pruning, you're focusing primarily on the butt log. Here they've done a second lift on radiata pine in New Zealand. And again, some of these trees it looks pretty aggressive on, they tend to grow through it just fine. Here's some other examples using ladders in La Valle pine, again, not operational. And then, you know, equipment like bucket trucks that you may see used, you can see this is a park here. Uh, you may see that used in an urban forestry context. You almost never see that used operationally in a timber operation. It's almost always hand saws with people on the ground. So $2.50 a tree um, times however many trees you're doing this on per acre, 50 to 250 bucks an acre. Um, and so I talked about, you wanna combine this with crop tree management, only prune your crop trees. Here's why we don't see a lot of pruning, okay? If you think about pruning and you drive around East Texas, you see very few stands that have been pruned. So if you're gonna spend 50 to 250 bucks an acre, you need to know that at the end of the rotation, when you clear cut that stand, you'll be able to take those trees to the mill. You'll be able to tell the mill, we pruned these 10 years ago, and that mill will say, okay, I'm going to pay you more dollars per ton for these trees because we're going to saw higher grade boards out of them. Okay? If the mill isn't going to say that, then you wasted your money on pruning. Um, you sold the mill great trees that's going to make them more money. But if they are unwilling to pay you more money for those trees because you prune them, then you just lost all the landowner's money prescribing this pruning operation. So where pruning makes sense is when the landowner also owns the sawmill, okay? And so the old vertically integrated forest product companies had sudden sawlog systems where they pruned trees on their land, sold it to their mills, cut higher grade boards out of their mills, sold those and made more money on them, okay? Nowadays, all the TMOs, the Timberland Investment Management Organizations, they don't own any mills. Um, so if you have a company like Hancock out there, if GP isn't gonna pay them more uh, for trees that have been pruned, there's no reason for them to be pruning, okay? Because they're gonna lose money on it to make another company more money. And so you don't see any of the TMOs really pruning anymore. Um, where you may see pruning still occurring is in the REITs, the Real Estate Investment Trusts, because they will own the land essentially, I'm oversimplifying, but they'll own the land, they'll own the trees, and those will go to mills within the same company. So by far the most pruning you see done in the West Gulf Coastal Plain um, is gonna be by Weyerhaeuser, where they're pruning trees on Weyerhaeuser land, cutting those trees, sending them to Weyerhaeuser mills, um, and selling those boards. And, you know, it's all the same company. Uh, they split it into the REIT and non-REIT side. It's more complicated than that. I'm oversimplifying, but you, you can kind of think of it as being all the same company. And so unless you know the mill is going to pay you for your pruned trees, don't waste the landowner's money on pruning. Um, if you have a landowner that's going to prune no matter what, um, document it as best you can. Keep the contracts, photograph it, be able to prove to the mill as best you can that, yeah, these trees are coming off a prune stand. Uh, you could actually over prune. Warehouser's been pruning up in their Oklahoma, Arkansas region for 30 years now, um, and it's gotten to points in some years, they have so many trees they've pruned that they have so many grade one boards, they can't sell them all. So they have to sell some of their grade one boards as twos or threes. They have to downgrade them because they basically cut more than there was a market for. So even if you're going to prune and you know you're selling prune boards out of your mill, you can over prune. You, you need to get more sophisticated with it. Uh, you need to prune the stands where you're really going to get value off that. Maybe where haul distances are shorter to the mill, site indices are higher, rotations are shorter. Those are the sort of things you're considering with a pruning operation. Uh, here's a, a good example where they've done good competition control. They've done a good thinning operation. They've pruned it. 90 trees per acre, and that's going to be some pretty nice quality saw timber in the near future. Here's a photo I took on a warehouser stand up in Oklahoma. And again, sometimes right after they prune, it looks pretty aggressive, but <clears throat> you know, the trees end up being fine. 
uh, they go with a 20 foot log in this region with their mills, so they prune 21 feet up. Um, this, this works really well with the thinning regime that we see in Lavalle Pine. So we've already talked about our thinning guidelines. You probably can't commercially thin a stand until your average quadratic mean diameter is about six inches. You can remove between half a load and a load of merchantable material per acre. And the trees need to be about 40 feet tall uh, so that you can fit your products on log trucks. Well, if the tree's 40 feet tall when you thin it, then you're gonna think about pruning after that. Well, if you have a 20 foot log, you need to prune 21 feet up. You've removed about half the live crown considering it from a vertical standpoint. What we find when you cut live limbs off a tree, it's, it's gonna have some effect on growth possibly, right? If you cut dead limbs off a tree, no effect on growth, okay? Because th those limbs weren't photosynthesizing, they had no live leaves on them, you're good. Um, it's gonna take those branch scars larger to heal up. But if you cut live branches, they heal real well. But think about what you've done. You've lowered the leaf area on the tree. So the question is, are you going to reduce growth? Well, the nice thing is, if you don't exceed about half the live crown ratio, you're usually good. It's not gonna reduce growth. Virginia Tech did some studies on these, uh, Dr. Burkhart, and th they did some real aggressive thinning, not anything that would be operational, just to look at, you know, how does thin thinning affect future growth? And so they, they were in some treatments thinning half the live crown or more out of trees every three years. Uh, again, not operational, just something very extreme. Everything they did operationally, they couldn't detect any real difference in tree growth on Lobolly Pine. When they went with some really extreme experimental treatments, way more than you would do operationally, they started seeing some impacts on growth. And so as long as you stick to not removing more than about half the live crown vertically, which ends up being about 20 feet in Lobolly Pine, because you're not going to thin until they're 40 feet tall, um, it seems to work pretty well. You don't have reductions in growth. Um, but, you know, here, I flip past this pretty quick, but, you know, th there are a lot of advantages to cutting those live branches out in terms of getting to better quality products quicker. Okay, so these are some examples from a study in Doug Fur, and again, this just shows you, this, this is cutting 60% uh, of the live crown out. It looks like more than that because of that conical shape of the trees. This is 40% of the live crown. Looks like these little poodle top trees. Again, you start going over 50%. You can understand why this may reduce growth a little bit. Uh, you know, that, that's pretty aggressive on those trees. Okay, any questions on pruning for timber management? Okay, um, I wanna wrap up with salvage and sanitation treatments, just brief coverage. I know this ties into what you're doing with Dr. Colhavy in insects and disease. Um, with a salvage operation, something has happened and you're harvesting damaged or dead trees and trying to pull some value out of them. Uh, this could be insect or disease. This could be mortality due to drought, fire, tornado, hurricane, any sort of disturbance that can kill tree, ice damage. Um, so it really could be a wide array of different disturbances. Uh, sanitation is often a pre-commercial operation. It could be commercial. It's often pre-commercial low. And basically you have a small problem now you're trying to prevent from becoming a large problem. And so really this is focused on forest health, really focused on insects or diseases with a sanitation operation. And if you think about that, you can't really do a sanitation operation for wind or ice or a lot of our other disturbances, drought, uh, because you can't catch them when they're impacting just a small portion of your stand, cut down those affected trees and somehow confer resistance or resilience upon the rest of your stand. Uh, but with an insect or disease, if you have a beetle spot that's just an acre or two in size, and you can contain it with a sanitation cut, it may keep it from spreading to the rest of your stand. So a sanitation operation is really focused on insect or disease, um, and it, it's probably pre-commercial, but it keeps a one or two acre loss from becoming a 50, 500, 5,000 acre loss. And so you're spending some money to avoid losing a whole lot of money. Um, I took these from Texas Forest Service, some ideas for southern pine beetle salvage logging. Um, and this is a scenario where you can afford to put the timber, timber on a log truck. You have some sort of small beetle spot um, and you come in here and you cut out the affected trees. Uh, you can see if you look here, there's live trees over here that are gone in this other image over here, figure two. And so they, they've cut out a green tree buffer 
that tends to be about the height of the trees. So you're probably looking at 50 to 70 feet in height, uh, just to help prevent the spread. Uh, if, if your beetle impact, you can see there's dead trees on the right, uh, some trees that are dying on the left, unaffected trees further left. So you get the sense this beetle outbreak is spreading from right to left, which is why they cut the green tree buffer out there. So here's the idea, identify your active trees, um, cut out that buffer width that's about the average height of your stand, uh, salvage harvested, get the infested logs out. Do not damage the residuals, because if you damage a tree, then maybe that tree ends up being more susceptible to infection or uh, attack by those beetles. This could be southern pine beetle. You may be doing something similar for Ips nowadays. Recheck the spots and make sure you've got it all. If it's a sanitation operation, say you can't get a log truck out there and you can't remove that, um, say it's only an acre in size. You may not have enough tonnage that a logger is interested, but you may be able to hire someone to go out there on foot with a chainsaw and do this, uh, which you've spent some money, you've lost some value, but if you can contain it when it's small, it'll save you a lot of money potentially in the long term. So now they go out with the chainsaw, they leave the trees that are already dead standing, they fell the actively infected trees, and they fell that same live tree buffer. And look at what they're doing. They're felling them towards the beetle spot, not away from the beetle spot. And so the idea here is very similar to a salvage operation, except you leave everything down in the woods. They want you to leave these uh, old dead trees with the idea that it'll they will hopefully attract predators of the beetle and parasite of the beetle. And that may help you control this southern pine beetle outbreak. And again, go and retrack the spot. Be careful here also not to damage your live trees. Um, you know, so if you were felling this tree here and it hung up in this tree and skinned it up good, you probably want to go ahead and fell that tree also. So, And that's it uh, on our timber management topic. So any questions on timber management?